Cash. According to a popular saying, it is king. Here in the United States, where many transactions now take place with a click, a swipe, or a scan, there's more cash in circulation than ever before. Whether it's the way it looks or the way it feels, there's no denying that cash contains an appeal that often exceeds its financial value. Our hundreds and fifties embolden us with a temporary feeling of wealth. How often have you hesitated before breaking one? We love our twenties, routinely dispensed from ATMs, and a bill with increasing demand in the United States and abroad. Tens and fives, perfect for our morning coffee, juice, or fast food habits. The familiarity of these rounded numbers providing a comfort zone in the way we spend. And then there's the one, which makes up nearly one third of our currency population. Arguably one of the most recognizable pieces of currency in the world. Yes, we have quite the portfolio of currency denominations, don't we? But wait, aren't we forgetting someone? That's right. There's another piece of currency in our portfolio, a little used, often neglected denomination. Maybe you've seen one before, maybe you haven't. It's known as the $2 bill. People don't realize that there is a currency denomination called the $2 note. When was the last time you were at a supermarket they gave you change with a $2 bill? It's a little bit quirky, it's a little bit different than all the other denominations. The twos live sad lives. Most who sit in Federal Reserve banks and don't see the light of day because people don't want them. There is no place for $2 bills in a cash drawer. Hence, there's no place for them in your pocket, no place in commerce. It's a novelty more than anything else. I think if you got rid of it, no one would notice <laughs> for the most part. It's not a stretch to say that most Americans are decidedly misinformed about the $2 bill. And for most of my adult life, I'm guilty of being in that majority. One of the more common misconceptions about twos is that they're hard to come by. But as I found out one Tuesday morning, all you have to do to get them is go to the bank. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. How can I help you? Well, um, I kind of have an odd request. Okay. Uh, my son's got a few loose teeth, mm -hmm. and we want to be ready when the tooth fairy has to come. So I wanted to know if you had any $2 bills. Sure. How many do you need? You have them. Uh-huh. I have a fresh stack of a hundred worth right here. Oh, I don't need a hundred. I just need like... Yeah, you know what? Uh, I'll take... I'll take that whole stack. I'll okay. take the whole stack of a hundred. My name's John. Now, I may not be as much of a $2 bill enthusiast as some of the people you'll soon meet, but for reasons I've never been able to explain, I've always been fascinated with them. Not everyone felt the same way as I did, though. How could I forget? Can we talk about the $2 bill? Could we? Yep. I despise the $2 bill. Why? Hey. They're the bastard stepchild of, of money. The only reason you ever give a $2 bill is to get rid of a $2 bill. I just love the reactions from people. That, yeah. You know how many times people have called the manager over because they're like, this is not real money. Well, that's my point. If everyone was smarter and they knew it was a $2 bill, then I wouldn't have a problem with it. It was at that point where I was given a sign. And I knew it was time to start learning a lot more about the $2 bill. You see, I'd heard stories about managers and $2 bills before. One of them took place at Taco Bell. It was an old urban legend, which probably came through your email at some point. And it was true, as I learned when I visited its author, Kurt Kohler. This was in the 90s. Taco Bell had a new 7 liter brio, and it was 99 cents at the time, which is cheap, and I was young, and so that was perfect. And so I had one $2 bill, and I had a 50 for some reason. I can't tell you why I had that. That's a lot of money then, right? But I kind of gave him the choice. Here's the 50, here's a two. Like, which do you want to take? Turned out they didn't want to take the 50 because it's a large bill and uh, they didn't know what the two was. So the manager comes out and the manager had never seen a $2 bill either, which is surprising. And it's like, well, I've never seen this before. You know, I'm not taking this. 
He ended up calling mall security, which is an you know, odd choice, but mall security came. That guy knew you know, what a $2 bill was. So there was like a little exchange that happened where it became clear to the people working there that, oh, the $2 bill is a real thing? Oh, oh, okay, yeah. And then um, they ended up giving me the meal for free because they uh, wasted my time. So they felt bad about it and they said, well, here you go, you know, sorry about that. Uh, the internet was new and there weren't websites really yet or anything like that. There was a culture of posting just random stories and random things to news groups. So this to me was hilarious. And so I just came home and stream of consciousness, you know, wrote it down and then sent it. It got passed around. And I think that story hit a nerve at that point because I walked into Taco Bell, I tried to spend real money, they should be trained to know what money is, you know, that sort of thing. A similar incident happened to Mike Ballesta at a Best Buy once with more dire consequences. I was in jail. <laughs> Mike owns Capital City Student Tours, which takes class trips to historic cities on the East Coast. And when the students get money for their lunch, I always give them $2 bills. The excess Mike often has came in handy when personnel from Best Buy went back on an agreement not to charge him for installing his son's car stereo. We got a call threatening us with the police if we didn't come in and pay the bill. So I thought a little bit, and I thought, OK, it's a little over $100. I think I'll pay in twos. So I went to Best Buy, paid with the $2 bills. And the girl marked them all with a pen and went and talked to her manager. And the manager came over and said, these aren't real. We've called the police. I said, please, you're making a big mistake here. Young policeman walked in. Handcuffed me behind my back and took me out. It turned out they called the Secret Service. The Secret Service said they're real. So uh, they told me I could go. It was embarrassing. You know, if you're an American citizen and don't know we have $2 bills in our currency, you shouldn't be a cashier because look what can happen. I wanted to know if these negative reactions to $2 bills were typical of vendors everywhere. The person who would know best is Heather McCabe, a copy editor in New York City who's been spending twos since her early 20s and noting the results. There's a collection of reactions to it uh, that form a pattern. It, to me, is very intriguing. And at some point last year, after doing this for maybe 15 years, I thought, it's time to start a project. And so I started to document exactly what happened. Um, I took photographs of people with the $2 bills in a state of surprise or happiness. And then I took down their stories and got their quotes. And now I have a website where I put all that stuff up. At twobuckaroo.com, Heather shares stories from all the local establishments she's visited. This guy's funny. No one's called the police on her, but the bill almost always evokes the same positive response. The most common reaction is that people normally smile, the eyes get wide, they have an exclamation of happiness, and then extremely often they want to share an anecdote. I don't have to prompt them for it, they just whip out a story about a $2 bill that they encountered in their life. Sometimes if they don't say anything, I'll prompt them, but uh, the majority of the time someone just starts talking because they're very excited to see this bill that they think is very rare. This guy was interesting because he didn't know $2 bills were still in circulation, so when he saw I had a whole wallet full, he asked to buy them from me. There is this illusion of scarcity uh, that, like gold or silver or something else, that, that the two is, is pulling off this little trick. People have decided it is this kind of talisman, this kind of uh, treasure, in a way that they don't treat other money. The $2 bill only appears rare when compared to other notes. Although it pales in comparison to the number of ones and even hundreds out there, there are still over one billion twos in circulation. But the perception of rareness remains. In fact, MIT graduate Eric Mintz conducted a survey about $2 bills and asked, what's so special about them? You'll never guess what the results were. My research showed the number one reason why people found this bill interesting was due to rareness. So there is some phenomena going on with this thing. People were sort of holding on to these things and not really putting them back into circulation. That's a fact I tried to remedy, while also seeing if Heather was right, once I got a few $2 bills of my own. Do a lot of people pay with $2 bills? Hardly ever. I may have to buy them all. You may have to buy them. <laughs> because they're, they're rare. They don't make them anymore. I find it so fascinating that the $2 bill is 
a novelty, even though it's completely readily available and people don't even know it. So my goal with this is to just disabuse people of the notion that it doesn't exist, because a lot of people think it's not made anymore, it's not there anymore, but it is. A lot of people think we don't produce them anymore. And actually, since 1976, there have been nine printings of the two. It really is an art that we do here. You know, th this note is absolutely beautiful, and particularly on the back of the note. Look at all of the intaglio printing that's on the back. And, you know, intaglio printing is the staple to American currency. Intaglio printing is very deep, fine lined engraving and it's where the ink actually recesses into the fine line engraving, and then the engraved image is then pushed onto the paper, and hence the, the beautiful engraving and printing that we have here on this sheet. There's a lot more intaglio printing on the twos than on the other denominations, and you know the employees here are very proud of what they do. We're in the plate making and engraving area, Plate making is actually where we produce plates that are used in production and all the process that occurs with those plates until they're ready to go out on the production press and be utilized. The engravers who actually engrave the plates, they put the location of the plate numbers on the back and the front of the sheet. And there's something really special about these twos. We can tell that these twos are produced here in Fort Worth because of the small FW that is on the notes. And that's how we tell that these notes are produced in Fort Worth, Texas. Yeah, so we're, we're checking out all the intaglio details on this plate. This is a beautifully engraved $2 plate that will be utilized in the intaglio printing process. With the twos, we start off with blank paper. The paper is actually made of 75% cotton, 25% linen. This press runs at 10,000 sheets per hour, 32 subject sheets, and this is all back printing. The backs are done first because they have a significant amount of intaglio engraving, and then it dries for 72 hours. Because these sheets have so much ink on them, when they dry, they dry like bricks. In order to break the sheets apart so they can be face printed, we're actually going to blow air in between the, the load and break the sheets apart so they can individually be fed into the press. Then we go to face printing. And that takes another 72 hours to dry. Then it's broken up into two 16 subject sheets. And then it goes to letterpress printing, which is known as currency overprinting. This is where you have your Federal Reserve seal, Treasury seal, and your serial numbers are printed onto the note. Just with the amount of art that goes into this note as it was designed, the two is the tradition. It kind of goes back to the old style of currency. People love the intaglio print. It was upon hearing the words old style when I realized that if most people didn't even know the twos exist, they certainly wouldn't know about any old style $2 bills. And neither did I. So I took it upon myself to learn some $2 bill history by heading to Orlando for the Florida United Numismatists Convention, otherwise known as FUN. I'd never been to a numismatics show before. There were stacks of cash everywhere. I'd like to say that I'd never been in a room with this much money before, but I had just been to the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Still, there were plenty of $2 bills to be seen, even in wallet form. I got to see twos from Fiji, Jamaica, Zimbabwe, New Zealand, and Barbados, as well as many of the early notes in United States history. Sergio Sanchez, a South Florida dealer, showed me the first federally issued $2 bill from 1862. But if you notice here in this circle, there's a one, a two, and a three. 
on the $1 bill, the white area is on the one. The $2 bill, as you can see, the background is two, and they were thinking of doing three. They never got to there. Sergio also showed me an 1869 $2 bill. And they call this a rainbow series, and it's because if you notice a different tint of color. As well as $2 silver certificates from 1886 and 1899. What's a silver certificate, you ask? Well, whereas today's currency is known as fiat currency, backed by nothing more than faith in government, silver certificates were backed by actual silver, mined in the West and minted by the U.S. government. The federal government has a big supply of silver, and based on the silver that it holds, the federal government can issue notes that are backed by the silver. You could present the note to the bank and say, please give me silver in return for this note. John Marcus showed me the most ornate $2 silver certificate, one from the educational series, circa 1896. Beautiful bill here. This is actually a school teacher, and uh, she's embracing her students. And uh, at the time, this particular note was considered very racy. They are objects of their time. Treasury historian Franklin Knoll and whatever art influences are out there at the time will tend to be reflected back into the currency. The intricate design on these notes are actually had their foundation in the pre-Civil War. Before 1862, states allowed their banks to create their own notes. So each bank could issue notes in whatever denominations they wanted. And in order to kind of separate themselves, they designed these very intricate and unique bank notes, which meant that there were at least a thousand different unique $2 bills. These were known as obsolete or broken banknotes because the further away you got from the bill's city of issue, the less likely it would be accepted at face value. If the bank went broke, the bill became obsolete. This system mostly came to an end with the onset of the Civil War in 1861. Both the Union and the Confederacy needed more revenue to finance their efforts. While the Confederacy printed their own money, mostly single-sided currency that looked like these bills, the Union at first tried to borrow their way through the war. And the kinds of interest rates that the federal government was being offered on loans from the banks were usurious. So Congress responded by passing three legal tender acts, as they were called. And these three acts authorized the issuance of, in total, about $450 million in United States notes. Which takes us back to Sergio's table, where I saw the first of these larger-sized notes, which were known as greenbacks. He also showed me an 1891 $2 note backed by coin, as well as a regular 1917 note. But the most interesting bill from the convention was showed to me by Ed Kuzmar, who invited me to his currency shop in South Florida to see a bill that endeared itself to me right away. What I have is one of the most popular $2 bills. It's called the Lazy Two, because the two is on its side. This note was a series of 1875. It was a completely new design. They're done to basically ward off counterfeiting. The more complicated the design, the harder it is to replicate. Now I understood the tradition of twos I'd learned about at the BEP. Each two I saw had a back that was exquisitely crafted. The 1886 silver certificate with its hidden two in the lettering to the famous battleship note. This was issued in 1918 and helped celebrate World War I but it was the last of the large size $2 bills. By 1928, the size of currency had been reduced and a more familiar looking $2 bill was issued. This $2 bill shows Monticello, or Monticello depending on where you're from. Monticello is the home of Thomas Jefferson here in Charlottesville, Virginia, third president of the United States, and he drafted the Declaration of Independence. One of the few places you'll find where they actually are happy to give you a $2 bill is Monticello. The uh, mission of Monticello is preservation and education of Monticello and Thomas Jefferson's legacy. We see about 440,000 visitors per year, and so when we give visitors change, we give them our $2 bill as change. They also give them out in the gift shop, where I met cashier Christy Campbell. Would you like a $2 bill in your change? Yes. Okay. I like to offer everybody, you know, I like to talk about the history of it. The fact that Jefferson's on the front, he's also on the back. He's the tall man right there. Okay. It's part of the mission. We like to get Jefferson out there. And when they get a $2 bill, they remember the history 
behind Jefferson, his legacy, and what a great man he was. It's hard to understand Jefferson without Monticello and Monticello without Jefferson. It embodies who he was, the architect, the botanist, the scientist, the experimenter, the Renaissance man. Jefferson was a man who was full of eccentricities and had very particular tastes. He lived in Monticello in the lap of luxury. He has the largest wine collection in the colonies. He's very sophisticated. And in a way, Jefferson was a bit quirky, the way the $2 bill is kind of quirky. So what's interesting is that the biggest political rivalry in American history was between Hamilton and Jefferson. What you saw was basically Hamilton and Jefferson proposed the ideas for what our new government should look like. Hamilton favored a more centralized, more activist uh, federal government. Jefferson, the more decentralized, the more passive role for government. What makes it even more interesting about the $2 bill is much of their feud was over money. Uh, Hamilton favoring it, Jefferson opposing it. So these guys had this great feud. And Hamilton was the first guy on the $2 bill because he was the first Treasury Secretary. And then he gets replaced by Jefferson, and I don't know why that is. $2 notes have featured others besides Hamilton and Jefferson. Even George Washington has been featured on one. But how they got there is really anyone's guess. The history of design is really unwritten. All we can say is, in the end, it's the Secretary of the Treasury who will approve a design. With Thomas Jefferson on the last of the large-sized $2 notes in 1918, it was natural for him to migrate to the 1928 series. But Americans would soon be entering an era known as the Great Depression, and the $2 bill began to lose its practicality in a frugal economy. During the 30s, even though people are hoarding cash, they don't want twos. They're turning them back into the Treasury. People became far more comfortable with using ones. And responding to demand, the Treasury started issuing more ones and more ones. It would be another quarter century before more $2 bills were printed. The 1953 series featured a slight redesign with a shifting of the red seal and a reduction of the large lettered two, just to name a few. With little functionality though, and consumers who were more comfortable with other denominations, print runs declined sharply. The 1963 series saw just 18 and a half million notes printed. It was the beginning of the end for the $2 bill. The demand for twos dried up. Then in 1966, issuance of twos ends. By executive order, now they were going to be removed from circulation. The two stayed dormant and out of people's minds for almost a decade. It took a major event in America's history before it would begin its comeback. We're gathered in this historic house for an opportunity that comes to a people once in a century the celebration of the 200th anniversary of the United States, which will take place in 1976. We have representatives not only from the federal government, but from most of the states of the nation here to plan that celebration. In 75, uh, one of the big things was the, the bicentennial was coming up the following year, and I had read a couple of things in the New York Times uh, about the possibility of bringing back the $2 bill. And I'd always had a, a special place in my heart for it. Evan Zucker was on his way to graduating from the University of Rochester when he landed a job as an intern for Congressman Mike McCormick in the spring of 1975. It was the perfect job from which he could keep close tabs on the status of the $2 bill. HR, which stands for House Resolution uh, 819, was a bill to uh, direct the Secretary of Treasury to uh, bring back the $2 bill, to start printing a new type of $2 bill. And it was sort of languishing in the, uh, that subcommittee. But I thought bringing back a new and different $2 bill, I, I really liked that idea. And so uh, I wanted to see if there was anything I could do to help push that along. Zucker sent a letter to the numismatic editor of the New York Times, urging readers to write to the chairman of the House subcommittee. Coming off as an authority thanks to his new position, the letter was published in May of 1975. So my title was media consultant. I think that's what they called interns, and it was perfectly legitimate. I, I think that conveyed a little more weight. Even if legislation didn't pass, the two could still be revived on a direct order from the Secretary of the Treasury. According to Steve Sarl, that process had begun as well. I was a public information officer at the Department of Treasury in the office of the Secretary who at that time was Bill Simon, and just happened to be in the office when the two kind of had a resurgence in discussion about it being reissued. There was a feeling that, okay, 
we're 200 years old now, uh, to 200. Uh, we've got a bill that's gone out of favor. This is a great occasion to relaunch. And there was a financial reason to reissue the $2 bill. Remember, there were huge gas shortages at that time. And there was also an effort on the part of the government to reduce spending. At that time, they were printing 1.8 billion $1 bills per year. And what they want Treasury wanted to do was cut that back to 900 million and to supplement that with 400 million $2 bills. So you'd have nearly the same value of currency out, but you were, they'd be printing 500 million fewer bills. That was a generating factor to reissuing the two. The government was doing lots of things in connection with the bicentennial, and this would tie in nicely. So it was a way sort of killing two birds with one stone. The pieces were coming together for a reissue, except for one burning question. Basically, why do we need it? There was a great question as to whether or not people would use a $2 bill if it was brought back. The reason it was discontinued in 66 was lack of use. So uh, there was a study done. The Department of Treasury commissioned a study for the Harvard Business School specifically to poll people to find out would people use it. The survey team at the Harvard Business School did not find strong enthusiasm for a return of the two. However, 97% of the respondents indicated that if the denomination came back into circulation, they would willingly accept it. It may not have worked out that way, but at the time, that's what the study results were. And the argument that some people doing research for the Treasury came up with, if we flood the country with twos, they will be used. The decision was made to reissue the $2 bill. Once you decide there will be some acceptance, you link it with the bicentennial, then you say, well, let's make it as beautiful as we can. There was little doubt that John Trumbull's Declaration of Independence, housed in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol, would adorn the back of a reissued $2 bill. Trumbull's version was commissioned by the Capitol in 1817, but it was based on an earlier version of the painting, located at the Yale University Art Gallery. Trumbull repositioned several figures and even removed Richard Stockton, seen here. Still, the configuration of the painting caused a bit of a conundrum. I gathered that it was too large, even in a reduced form, to fit everything on there, along with the other elements that they needed to include on the back of the bill. Even by expanding the area available for an image, it would be difficult to include all 47 individuals neatly. There needed to be some adjustments. So George Wythe, William Whipple, Josiah Bartlett, and Thomas Lynch Jr. on the left, and Thomas McKeon and Philip Livingston on the right were, excuse the pun, history. Artistic license is always taken uh, when you're reproducing something for another purpose. Additional changes reflected the painting's Yale origins. The individuals Trumbull repositioned were put back, including George Walton, who Trumbull placed here, and Abraham Clark, who was returned to his original position. Richard Stockton was reinserted as well. The result? I think it's the most uh, beautiful of the engravings, and it showcases the fantastic talent of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing Engravers in being able to capture the essence of that original painting. And Evan Zucker would like you to know one more fact about Trumbull's painting and the back of the $2 bill. It's always bothered me that it's, it's frequently, almost always referred to as the signing of the Declaration of Independence, whereas in fact, it is not. It's just the Declaration of Independence is the name of that painting. And it is the Declaration of Independence being presented to the Continental Congress by the committee that drafted it. And Thomas Jefferson was one of the members of the committee. That's what that painting shows. With the back decided on and a minor facelift to the front, the presses rolled and 400 million newly designed $2 bills were about to be issued. But unlike other denominations about to be circulated, the reissue of the two had to be pushed. It was different for the $2 bill because it hadn't existed at all since 66 and even then it was rarely seen. We did issue a press release to consumers and businesses, yes, the federal government is asking you to use it. To banks, we said, you must use it. You must put it into change. And that they did. The new two was released on April 13, 1976, a celebration of Thomas Jefferson's birthday. Tens of thousands of people rushed out to get theirs. 
but not to put them into circulation. People would go to their bank and get, uh, you know, $2 bills, and they would then take them to the post office and get them stamped and postmarked with the postal seal of April 13th, 1976, commemorating that it's the first day of issue. The rest of America had different reactions. Once it was issued, we had thousands and thousands of phone calls from businesses and consumers. And I was the key guy to handle those phone calls. Now remember, this is phone calls, landline, uh, with extensions, and all the red buttons were lining up all at the same time for weeks, literally. I spent most of my days just answering calls. And those calls really fell into two camps. One camp which was, what the heck is this? This is weird, this isn't real. Where do I return these? I'm sending these back. What's your address at the Treasury Department? And the other half of the calls were, gee, what a great thing, this is fantastic. I'll go get 10 of them at the bank and I'll put them away and someday they'll be worth $1,000. And we really had to very forcefully say no, Please go out and spend them, that's the idea. I certainly got as many as I could and I started spending them, but I, I know I didn't start getting many back in return. I don't remember how I learned that that the, the, this $2 bill was, was coming out and all I knew was I needed to get one. <laughs> so I did. Eight-year-old Christopher No gathered up $2 worth of change and took it to the local market to purchase his first ever $2 bill. So I didn't do much with it. I kept it in my sock drawer for many years. And once I was old enough to have a wallet, I put it in my wallet. And it's been there ever since. I have several at home. Uh, yeah, I, and I don't spend them. It's in, in storage at my, at my mom's house. Uh, I have one in my car. I had a bunch of $2 bills that I just kept. I don't know why. I have no idea why. It, it seemed special. It seemed more unusual. I mean, I, I, I can't think of words to explain it, but there's just something magical about them. I, I think the artwork, it was really interesting. It was different than the, uh, any of the other bills. Everybody would treat it as kind of a special bill. And I think maybe there is some credence to that thought that this is just too beautiful to spend. And so people might well have just thought that, of this as, well, it's something special for the bicentennial. I'm gonna go home and keep this. It did get more accepted for a period of time, and then we kind of all forgot about it. The treasury got stuck with sheets of twos in the vault, and in 78, they basically ended production for a while. Before we go any further, there's something I have to confess. Hi. I didn't need to go to the bank to get $2 bills. You see, I'm a $2 bill hoarder as well. In an old checkbook box in my desk drawer, I have 11 of them that I've accumulated since I was a child. But there was no way the Tooth Fairy was getting any of these. They meant too much to me. No, she'd be giving my son a two that I hand-picked myself from a pile of them that turned out to be anything but ordinary. One person with a similar affinity for the $2 bill is MIT graduate Eric Mintz. I remember when they came out with the, the new Bicentennial bill and I was just taken with it. I have a number of $2 bills that I've collected over the years and um, never really talked to anybody about it. It wasn't until he took an accounting class with Dr. Christopher No that he saw the power of the two firsthand. No uses his childhood $2 bill every semester. There's a concept in accounting called fair value accounting, and it's illustrated quite nicely with my $2 bill example. To help illustrate this concept, I'd pull the $2 bill out of my wallet. What I would ask my students was, now if you were gonna do a balance sheet for me, what would you value this at? He's been holding on to this bill for 35, 40 years. And what happened next was kind of amazing. At that moment, in a class of about 60, I'd say a dozen students reached into their wallets or their purses and pulled out $2 bills and, and held them up. My first thought was, is, you know, wow, I'm not alone in my weirdness, right? <laughs> I've been using this $2 bill example, I mean, for as long as I've been teaching, and that had never happened before. Not a single student had ever done that before, and so it just taught me that the $2 bill was special not just to me, but to a lot of people. Clearly, something was going on, and that really is what started the research for me. Eric dove into a year-long project involving surveys and questionnaires. 
You may recall that Eric cited the perception of rareness as the number one reason people were interested in the two. The second reason tied in perfectly with what Eric experienced in Dr. No's class. The number two reason is nostalgia. And that's likely, you know, your parents, your grandparents holding on to these things for a variety of reasons. When they came out with the Bicentennial Bill and there was a sort of novelty factor, that increased the um, kind of behavior of people sort of taking these out of the supply and holding on to them, giving them as gifts. My name is Ann Cohen, daughter of Eugene Cohen. Eugene Cohen was a business executive. He was a soldier in Patton's army. He was a father and a husband. Two dollar bills were very special to my father. They were something that he gave away with pleasure and with passion and with blessing. When his grandchildren came, there was a two. On Passover, when we hid the matzah, it's called finding the afikoman, you got a two dollar bill. As he was dying, he would go through his two dollar bills and stack them and stack them and give them with his blessing. You have my blessing. So the last two dollar bills he gave to me and to each of my daughters, I carry all the time. It's part of who he was, just a tiny part of who he was, but you can carry it with you in, in the most joyous way. You know, there's absolutely this multi-generational, multicultural fascination with the $2 bill. You get that from a family member, you're likely, you're not gonna really put that back into the monetary supply, you're gonna hold on to it. So here they are, they're old ones, they're wrinkled, and it's not like I consider that I have money, because it's not money. It's $2 bills. It's this gift. It's this legacy. The nostalgia could have been replaced with the word sentiment. I think that they're interchangeable in this context. And you clearly see that in the stories, that there's that connection with the $2 bill, for sure. The $2 bill can connect more than just family members. In some cases, it can connect total strangers thousands of miles away. That's what happened between Norma Kearney and Nona Diamond in Oregon and Jesse Lynham in Texas. Jesse was in the Navy in the early 1940s, a time when they were paid exclusively in $2 bills. I was assigned to the USS Chicago, which is a heavy cruiser, until she was sunk on January the 31st, 1943. We were on shore leave, and we went to a, a USO-sponsored dance. We were paying our tab with $2 bills, and somebody had us to sign it, and they were going to keep it as a souvenir. That was in the summer of 1941, before the war started. About 73 years later, after we signed that bill and forgot all about it, then I received this phone call from a lady in Oregon. He said, hello, and I said, uh, yes, is this Jesse A. Lynham? And Jesse said, why, yes it is. And I said, excuse me, Mr. Lynham, were you in the Navy on the USS Chicago? And do you recall signing a $2 bill in 1941? And he said, well, I don't really recall, but maybe I did. Yes, it was quite a surprise. And at first I thought it was a prank. Norma had tried to find the owner of the bill on behalf of her mother, Nona, who came across the bill 30 years earlier when a customer at the post office where she worked bought a book of stamps with it. I saw that it was signed in 1941 by three sailors. Naturally, being a collector, I wanted it, and I bought it out of the post office. And on the $2 bill, it was written, A.J. Lynham, Texas. And so I did a search on A.J. Lynham in Texas, and it came up with a name and a phone number. And, and I was just so excited. I just couldn't hardly talk to him, you know, I was just so, so pleased. Uh, she was really shocked to find out I was still alive at the age of 93. And I offered to buy the $2 bill from her. And uh, she said, absolutely not. We wouldn't sell it, but we're going to give it to you and we're going to send it to you in the mail. I was still in a state of shock when I got the $2 bill and looked at it. My wife verified that that was my signature without a doubt. We have it in a small frame sitting on my mantle, and we have had a uh, constant relationship by phone ever since. As a way of saying thank you, Jesse sent Nona a framed collection of memorabilia, including a copy of the bill that Nona had held for 30 years. And this is a $2 bill that he sent me in thank you for this bill. 
It was thrilling, and I was so happy that we could find him. Due to this $2 bill, I was able to make friends with some mighty fine people, people which I valued very much. The two crosses, cultural and geographic and generational divides. Meet Matthew Zacklad, a man who knows a lot about the ways $2 bills connect people. Since the early 1990s, Matt's been arming himself with stacks of twos to spend in his daily routine. On one frigid day at the Union Square Market in New York City, I got to witness his interactions firsthand. Perfect. Thank you, Colin. Hey, the two department is out. Thank you. The two department is out. Spending twos has allowed me to have a relationship with people who I do not believe I would have a relationship with otherwise. How old is he now? 20, like 19, 20 months. I interact with many more human beings on a richer level. Even if it's one sentence, even if it's no words but a smile, it's always richer, guaranteed. He comes in around every day, every other day, and he always brings us $2 bills. All right, what do I owe you for that? Uh, 15 good. Brand That's it. Brand new. Well, not brand new, but they're nice and crisp. We have a slot in, uh, in the register just for Matt, for the twos. We put them on the sides, so we collect them. It's all the twos that Matt gave us today. It's a better lubricant for transactions. It's like cheers. They know me my name. I'm the two guy. Matt would always come by with them, twos, twos. And I'm like, hey, you know, what are you doing? He's like, hey, you know, I, I always spend twos. And I'm like, wow, it's really cool. And then after that, after, after a while, we built a relationship. And now he always comes by. We barely even ask him what he wants. We know what he wants. Matt gets the lamb gyro with uh, tzatziki, spicy hot sauce, which is a house made, both the tzatziki and the hot sauce. And he likes it extra spicy, so we kind of give him a nice little kick in there, you know? And I'm convinced that they got that as my special order very early because of the twos. That's for you. Thanks, Frank. I get a one. Everybody has those. Not everybody got the twos, right? You get something extra. You know, you get some more human interaction. You get a story. You get engagement. I love that. Matt's practice has even rubbed off on some vendors. Beekeeper and honey salesman Andrew Cote has his $2 bills lined up and ready to enhance the customer experience. On the counter, under bottles, on my side, I've got two $2 bills, so $4 to make change for the six and $16 items. Then folded beneath the counter, I've got stacks of five of them, which is $10, because I often get a $20 bill and I have to make change. Thank you. I think it helps business a little bit. Any time that I can get the customer to remember their experience here, provided it was a good one, then uh, it's a good thing. At nearby Tannen's Magic, another of Matt's frequent shopping haunts, owner Adam Blumenthal takes the idea of $2 bills as change to a deeper level. I think twos are great because they're not something that's familiar. If you get a $2 bill from us, the odds are you're not going to spend it. You're going to keep it and you're going to remember where you got it from. I think our customers, they leave with both what they're purchasing, magic tricks, and what's to them a unique and in some ways maybe even an impossible object. You know, we sell uh, decks of cards sealed inside a bottle. It's a sealed deck in a bottle. This is an impossible object. This can't happen. Um, but this is just as important to somebody. This is currency. It's normal. It shouldn't be something special. But this is almost as magical and as impossible as something that actually is. Magic was a word that seemed to come up a lot in my conversations with people about $2 bills. They are these magical objects. There's just something magical about them. That whole thing was magic. And it came up again when I spoke to Stephen Reisman, a successful New York attorney who gives back by handing out twos to virtually everyone. It does have a, a magic and a mystique to it. I've given them to people random, like in a meeting, people from deals that I worked on people in a restaurant, on vacation, and you should see how it's like, you know, Christmas morning on someone's face when they get it. And I recognize that it's $2, it's, you know, two sodas, it's a slice of pizza, what, it's, 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 just, it's just a piece of paper. But I actually think that, you know, when you give it to someone, the impact that it has on them is a lasting impact. The magic of Reisman's twos extends into his personal interests as well. He's a big fan of music, and his twos come with him whenever he attends a concert. You know, they came out with a concept years ago of some meet and greet. You can go backstage and meet One Direction. You can go backstage and meet Justin Bieber. And not just them, the people that they work with. And I give them a $2 bill. Everyone feels so special. The genuine act of giving $2 bills has made Reisman a popular figure in music circles, 
despite the fact that he doesn't represent anyone in the industry. You knew every lyric to that song, For you. and you just gave me a $2 bill. It's just another example of one of the tricks that $2 bill has up its sleeve. Even the artist, even the person that's worth $100 million, a $1 billion, whatever it may be, keeps the two. They'll never spend that $2 bill in their life, and that's the magic. Twos have, for many people, memories of giving or receiving as a child, a grandchild. They have that magic quality. They're little, little magic carpets that carry with them memories from another time. When people tell me that they have a two on them in their wallet that they got 10 years ago, I, I think of that magic carpet analogy, and it has on top of it a special set of stories or hopes or remembrances, and there's no other bill that has that. No other bill remembers. And along with those feelings, people project another quality onto their $2 bill. Not surprisingly, Eric's data shows it's the third reason why people find the bill so interesting. Yeah, the third reason was good luck. And this was a very common answer. People were passing these down to their kids or their friends for good luck. Uh, I keep one in my car, I keep one in my wallet. Uh, <laughs> just thinking about actually it's probably not working in my car, I've had a car accident, you know. No, I'd always heard it was bad luck. I certainly know that some people think they're bad luck because I know the results of the Harvard Business School study from 75. A significant percentage, I think it was two or three percent, thought it was bad luck. There seems to be some superstitious aspect to the two from the beginning. To find out where this all started, I visited Joe Nickel, an expert in the field of the paranormal and all things superstition related. The problem with almost all superstitions is it's very hard to say exactly when and where a superstition came about. And we have just such a situation with the $2 bill. But one idea is that $2 was a standard bet at racetracks. So the racetrack would have all these $2 bills then, they would pay off in $2 bills, and you could look like maybe you were spending too much time at the racetrack and you might not want the wife to know it, or uh, it might get you into some trouble. Another claim about the superstitions of $2 bills is that politicians sometimes went around paying $2 for a vote at election time. So having a $2 bill could have seemed a little incriminating. As best as we can tell, that's just an urban legend. Politicians have always been bought off, but it really wasn't a firm notion that it cost $2 per vote. Another one says that the bill became a bill of, shall we say, ill repute, when ladies of ill repute supposedly charged $2 for a trick. That's not real convincing to me. You're not getting the $2, you're paying $2. So doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Still one more, when the name for a two, particularly from card playing, was that it was a deuce. And deuce is another name for devil. And on the reverse of the $2 bill, if you magnify the engraving, you may be able to see the face of a demon-like or devil-like figure that's said to be Baphomet. This is a mystical figure that's proof of some conspiracies involving the Illuminati. Now, I've enlarged that here, enlarged the engraving, so we're talking about this area. And with a little imagination, maybe you can see two eyes, a nose, maybe horns. <laughs> There's a great deal of superstition around our currency because of all the symbols that are on there. And then when you introduce the odd $2 bill, I think it creates more of an idea of what is our government trying to do? We had those kind of calls too, the, the conspiracy theory calls. The same source that's uh, doing all the Illuminati talk posits that the words $2, you can rearrange the letters like a game of Scrabble and you can get two T-O Owls, lard, and if that doesn't make any sense to you, welcome to the club. But people touting this say, well, you see, it means if you go toward the owls, the owl being the symbol of the Illuminati, and if you fold the $2 bill a certain way, you can see that it makes a very nice looking owl. 
And then lard means wealth, or did at a certain time, about 18th century, that somehow two owls lard is supposed to be a statement that subliminally might influence people to join the secret society. If there was a group like that that was doing this kind of a thing, someone like Jefferson would be a perfect recruit. Someone who's that sharp with those kind of eccentricities invites conspiracy. So it's interesting that the $2 bill, the conspiracy theorist's choice for currency, is one that represents one of the most conspiracy-prone and, and quirky leaders in our history. Of course, the same kind of lore that tells you something is bad luck usually has a remedy to eliminate your misfortune. A great example, of course, is if you spill salt. Well, pick up a pinch of it and throw it over your shoulder and that'll take care of it. And the $2 bill has a similar set of, of rituals. One is to kiss it. Kissing the bill is a sort of way to bless it, or the saliva that moistens the kiss has all sorts of occult connotations. The other way to deal with that is you could tear off a corner. That's supposedly by some mystical power. It makes a triangle, of course, as you tear it off, and the triangle has all sorts of symbolism from the Trinity and, and so forth, and remove the magic. It was hard for me to believe that there really was a curse associated with the $2 bill. So at a local casino, I decided to see how one of my $2 bills fared. But I couldn't find a machine to accept it. This had happened before, once at a vending machine, and once when I tried to buy a subway token in New York. Why was this happening to me? It's not requested often. I don't think anybody's ever asked us, hey, can you make sure it takes $2 bills? Most machines can take $2 bills, and especially in the last 10 years, the latest generations of machines will take $2 bills. Unless somebody consciously programmed it to take it, more than likely it wouldn't. This one does not. There's two main factors, whether it takes a $2 bill or not. This is what we would call a dollar bill validator. So this is what's on the other side of this. This has firmware and can be programmed. Whether it accepts a $2 bill or not is as simple as switching a dip switch. In this particular model, it's switch number five. And whether it's on or off, tells it to accept the $2 bill or not. And it does, it registers a two. And even the machine can tell it to take a two. Go into the machine configuration, and now you'd go down to bill acceptance in the menu. To accept the dollar, it's on. To accept the $2, it's on. You could just as easily space down to that and turn it off if you did not want it to take a, a two. Should be ready to go. There was a time there where, in our best interest, it was to not accept them. Because then, if you're using a regular bill counter, you had to be really careful that a two didn't slip by. If one did, you may have stumbled onto the real origins of how a $2 bill came to be considered cursed. After the late 1880s, when all these ones started to appear and they started to overwhelm the number of $2 notes out there, people would just stack them together. And the problem is, if you're not paying attention, you're going to shortchange yourself. And so how do you distinguish between a one and a two in a stack of bills? You tear a corner off of the twos. And then you know when you hit the corner, you've hit a two. And after a while, this aura of a curse appeared, because if you consider shortchanging yourself a curse, the way to end that curse is to tear a corner off a note so that you don't shortchange yourself. No matter what people believe, one thing is certain. Convictions, in either direction, are strong. On the good luck side, convictions are so strong that the bill has often been sent great distances in order to secure good fortunes. Lift off. I think the biggest thing that people probably don't know about $2 bills is that they've been in space. We have a roll program initiated. My name is Richard Jurek, collector of the world's largest collection of space-flown $2 bills. Roger, understand. These $2 bills were taken by the astronauts within their own personal preference kits. These were their choice to take with as either good luck talismans or mementos, or they had some sort of personal attachment to this $2 bill. And as such, spanning both Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, uh, it spans the entire length of the U.S. human spaceflight program. 
The first $2 bill that I'm aware of happened on John Glenn's famous uh, orbital flight during the Mercury program in the 1960s. These bills were not taken by the astronaut on the mission, but the ground support crew secreted these bills aboard the spacecraft by wrapping them around the spacecraft wiring and signing little good luck wishes on the bill. Given that it was the first time an American orbited the Earth, uh, I guess they felt like John needed just that little bit of extra good luck for the mission. And then when it came back to Earth, John Glenn not only signed the bill, but so did Scott Carpenter, who was the backup pilot for this mission. So the next flight that we're aware of that a $2 bill flew into space was the last Mercury flight with Gordon Cooper. That trip made 22 orbits of the Earth. And so Gordo took a $2 bill to symbolize the uh, 22 orbits of his mission. This is a uh, 1917 large format $2 bill. And what's unique about this bill is he folded it into eighths and tucked it into his spacesuit pocket. So this bill was actually on his person for all 22 orbits of his flight. I would think given the uniqueness of this bill, because normal $2 bills were available at the time, uh, that this bill had special meaning to Gordon Cooper, and that's why he took it with him. Uh, Roger Clay, seven, ready, loud and clear. It then followed up with Gus Grissom and John Young on the first flight of the Gemini program, where it was the first time that two astronauts flew into space, thus the $2 bill that flew with on that mission. And then on the following mission, uh, on Gemini 4, uh, a $2 bill flew with Jim McDivitt for the first time an American did a spacewalk when Ed White opened the capsule and went out into space. That $2 bill was exposed to the vacuum of space for the first time. I consider this $2 bill the most unique $2 bill on the planet. Uh, this is Gene Cernan's good luck $2 bill that flew on all three of his space missions. And his father used to keep this $2 bill in his wallet, and he would take it to work all the time, and he took it for good luck. So when his son, Gene Cernan, went into space for the first time on Gemini 9, he gave Gene this $2 bill for good luck, and Gene took it with him, and it meant a lot to him. And it's an interesting historical fact that Gene almost died on that mission during his spacewalk. He almost didn't come back into the capsule. This bill was aboard Apollo 10, and Apollo 10 flew within just a few miles of the lunar surface. And with him, on his person, Gene had this $2 bill for good luck. And he and his co-pilot, Tom Stafford, accidentally flipped the wrong switch. And for just a few seconds, the lunar module was out of control in lunar orbit, and they almost crashed and died. But being the pros that they were, they instantly got control of their ship and they came back. So think about that. Gene now has a $2 bill that has practically saved his life not once, but twice. So when Gene was selected as the last man to walk on the moon for the Apollo Lunar Program, he took that $2 bill with him, not only into Earth orbit, not only into lunar orbit, but down onto the surface of the moon with him. And sure enough, he came back safely. That's beautiful. And Gene Cernan has signed the bill. Uh, this bill is worn for many reasons. It's probably the furthest traveled $2 bill on the planet. This note is the crown jewel in a collection of 11 bills that Richard features in a virtual museum at jeffersonspacemuseum.com. Richard would not state what he paid for the bills, but he has received several six-figure offers for the collection. This is due in large part because, based on where they've been and who signed them, these $2 bills actually are rare. That's in contrast, of course, to the voluminous number of $2 bills tucked away in homes across the United States, with the hopes that their perceived rarity will someday yield untold fortunes. At least, that's what I gathered after speaking with Laura Kessler. Laura is the vice president of PCGS Currency, an Illinois-based firm that authenticates and grades notes of all denominations to help establish their value. Their services are an important part of what is a nearly $5 billion collecting industry, and they're a staple at numismatic conventions, such as the one I visited in Orlando. Laura, who's fond of $2 bills herself, does see her share of truly unique twos. But those who are misinformed about the twos value also come calling. We do get uh, quite a few people who will bring, you know, 1976 $2 bills who inherited it from their grandparents. You know, grandma had a stockpile of those in her dresser drawer. and. I always tell somebody, these aren't very rare at all. They're kind of spenders, you know, tip money. 
but I don't want to offend somebody because they're precious to them for whatever reason. So I'll educate them on the scarcity or non-scarcity, that they're not as valuable. You know, you're not going to retire off, you know, grandma's notes. There are some people who think that the $2 bill inherently is more valuable than $2, but usually they're missing the significance that the ones that are more valuable are United States notes, not Federal Reserve notes. United States notes were those issued beginning in 1862 as the first federally issued currency. Early $2 bills were clearly designated as such. But the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 authorized the issuance of Federal Reserve notes, a designation which showed up on the $2 bill beginning with the popular battleship note. The key difference is that United States notes are created by the Treasury Department without costing the taxpayers a penny. You compare that with a Federal Reserve note, Federal Reserve note is not issued by the Treasury. It's issued by the Federal Reserve, the nation's central bank, which is a privately owned and directed bank for the most part. And when the federal government needs money, there is a cost to the federal government now. With the onset of the Federal Reserve system, United States notes would have disappeared completely, if not for an earlier congressional measure requiring that approximately $320 million in United States notes be kept in circulation indefinitely. These were found mostly in the two and five dollar denominations beginning in 1928, until the law was changed in the late 1960s, soon after the plug was pulled on the two dollar bill. The federal government removes two dollar bills from circulation in 1966. When they reintroduce it ten years later, they reintroduce the two dollar bill as Federal Reserve notes. Hardly any difference between the way they look. The main difference is that above Thomas Jefferson's face, it will either say United States note or Federal Reserve note. And the United States note will have a really cool red seal on the front of it as well. United States notes are more dear. They've been taken out of circulation. They continue to be withdrawn from circulation. Because they're rare, they're going to trade way more than face value. Whereas Federal Reserve notes, you can buy a Federal Reserve note for face value at any bank. Despite this fact, Laura will never turn anyone away when they present their $2 bill. I will look over each individual note because even with modern 1976 $2 bills, there are some that are better and worth money. How so? There are several ways. One is if it receives a high grade from PCGS or a similar company. That starts with the bill being uncirculated with no folds, instantly ruling out any of the bills in my collection. We assign a number to each note, 1 through 70, which is called the Sheldon scale, uh, 1 being very poor condition and 70 being absolutely perfect. Once we've determined that there are no folds, no corner bends, and there's no hard crinkles in them, the grade comes down to the evenness of the margins. Margin on this side, you're right, is larger than the margin on this side. So that factors into the grade. The quest for true high-grade notes, which is 65 PPQ or higher, is a common pursuit among collectors. But as far as the $2 bill is concerned, you'll find no one more passionate to find a perfect note than Michael Skirtis. My whole life I've been a collector, and I was born in 1976, so I had that connection there. You know, first year out, it was my birth year. Uh, really around 2007, I started taking a $2 bill collecting seriously. Just it's a daily basis where I'm really always looking and hunting for new $2 bills. Over the years, Michael has acquired an impressive number of the highest graded notes documented. So much so that his collection has been recognized by PCGS as the best small size modern currency set. He showed me some of his notes when I visited him in Portland, Oregon, including one that has been given a perfect score. This is the highlight to my high grade set as it is a 70. And there's only a handful of all $2 bills graded as a 70, they're this rare. So anytime that you get a note at a bank, it may look perfect, it may be uncirculated, but that doesn't mean that it's going to grade a 70 by any means. It's the centering, it's the corners, it's the crispness, it's literally a pristine note. The $2 bills you may have stashed at home probably won't grade close to a 70, but a bill with no folds that cross the design could score a 63, which would give them additional value. Failing that, another way for your modern two to be valuable is if you come across one with a star on it. What does the star mean? The star is a replacement. The Bureau of Engraving and Printing is just a big printing operation. They know in advance that they're going to make mistakes. So before they start a new series year of any denomination, they print stars. 
we have to make sure that all of the notes that we put out into circulation are in sequential order so the star is produced and inserted when there is a serial number that doesn't meet the quality standard that has been set. The BEP caught a mistake. Oops, there was an error on that note, which means there was probably one on the sheet. The whole sheet is removed and a sheet has to be replaced into that stack in order for the count to come out right, and that's where the star notes come in. They are the replacement for sheets that are removed for errors. $2 bills are limited in production, therefore $2 star notes are even more limited. A $2 bill from, let's say, 1976 that's a star might be worth anywhere from $20 to $50 in nice condition. In the great scheme of things, it's really not that valuable, but it's a lot less valuable than if we left the error in there, that would become a major high value collector's item and the Treasury is not in the business of creating collector's items. I mean, they do a great job. They were, last I knew, producing about 32 billion pieces of paper money every year, okay? It is not a precise and perfect operation. The amount of errors released is infinitesimally small, but they escape. When an error note does escape, it often ends up in the hands of Frederick Bart, a collector and published expert on paper currency errors. He agreed to show me some of the more exclusive notes in his collection, but their value mandated we meet in a private area, away from the convention hall. This is actually a pair of offsets, and they're basically a mirror image of one side transferred or transposed onto the other. What's really neat on the $2 bill is, in fact, we have Thomas Jefferson presiding over the Declaration of Independence, which he did. Another note. It is an instance where the whole overprint, the third printing, was applied twice. So we have an extra set of serial numbers, extra seals. It's visually dramatic. You can see it across the room. We know by serial number census, there's nine of these in existence. Um, this is something that trades in about the $25,000 range, if and when they're available. Fred showed me a variety of other error notes, which are not exclusive to the modern day twos. This 1862 bill has what's called a gutter, caused by the sheet having a slight fold when printed. Here's a silver certificate with a normal front and back, except when you look more closely, we can see that the back is in fact upside down. A similar mistake was found among Monticello bills as well. Back printed normally, the first printing, the second printing or face printed normally, but uh-oh, serial numbers and seals upside down. I don't think they have any of those in the Monticello gift shop. Finally, the most unusual bill of all. The double denom. It's referred to as the king of errors. This is a note that kind of looks normal. Not really a very big deal. It's from 1918. It's a $2 bill. And now as we go to the back, well, we have a slight problem. This is actually a $2 bill mated with the back of a $1 bill. This is America's $3 bill. Instead of a battleship here, we have a uh, heraldic eagle, a green eagle probably the price range is $75,000. Now, like me, you may be wondering if the bill's low grade would hurt its value. But with notes like these, that's never the case. Rarity, it doesn't really matter. You know, if it's the only one that's known, who cares what the grade is? And rarity can come in yet another form to make your $2 bill valuable. This is going back a little bit more earlier. It's a 1928 series. It just so happens that it's the uh, third one printed. A, all zeros, three A. And the number one is in the Smithsonian, and the number two is in private hands. I own the three, and I own the number four. What's its value? This one here, uh, I would say upwards of around $10,000. Yeah, I mean, if you have a, a $2 bill with a fancy serial number, that serial number, there's literally just one of them. When $2 bills are printed, the serial number is generated from several factors. The block prefix letter matches the letter of the corresponding Federal Reserve Bank from which the bills will be issued. The eight-digit serial number traditionally starts with number one and advances numerically throughout the run. The block suffix letter identifies the number of times the Bureau of Engraving and Printing used the sequence of serial numbers. It usually starts with A, but upon a new printing, or when the serial number rolls over like a car's odometer, the letter advances. Unless, of course, it's a star note. The result is a vast number of unique combinations that can make a bill valuable, some more rare than others. 
One of the most difficult serial numbers to get in any currency note is a solid. So a solid serial number is when all eight digits are the same, and the odds for that in the current print run are one in 10 million. And this is a solid serial number one on a $2 bill. Michael has as strong a passion for unique serial numbers as he does his high-grade notes. Among his 250 plus twos of this variety, he has many that are a lot more common than solids and low numbers, like a radar note. A radar note is when the serial number reads the same forwards and backwards. Every one in 10,000 notes printed is a radar. And similarly for a repeater note as well. A repeater serial number is when the first four repeat and the last four repeat in the eight digit serial number. And this is the repeater with the repeater serial number of 0888-0888. There's also a ladder, and it can be a full ladder as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Or it can be a partial ladder if you see the 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 serial number. Super radar and repeaters where it's just two digits that are repeating. But I'll come across high-end, very valuable $2 bills with fancy serial numbers, and they're very well circulated. And I always think to myself, like, why didn't anybody notice that? You know, this is a very crumpled up, well-circulated note, and it's serial number 60. And that, to me, when I look at a note, I always look at the serial number, but so many people don't. Michael lives for the hunt. So when he learned that new $2 bills were being made in 2013, it opened up new opportunities. I definitely get excited when a $2 bill is released when there's a new printing. It means another note or two that I can add to my collection. But the data shows that print orders have been declining over the last decade. The most recent order was the lowest since the turn of the century. Does that mean the $2 bill is once again destined for a date six feet under? It happened in Canada, where a $2 note featuring Queen Elizabeth II was discontinued in 1996 and replaced with a $2 coin affectionately known as the Toonie. That's unlikely to happen here in the States. There are many novelties out there uh, that people value very highly. So I'm sure there are many people who, who love the $2 bill and the government is happy to provide it for them at a, at a cost of $2. So are $2 bills still being printed simply for the novelty factor? Why do they keep making them? Back at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, I learned that all of their work is simply to fulfill an order placed by their clients, the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve definitely is the one who decides when it's the right time for the Bureau of Engraving and Printing to do a, another printing of the twos. They make the decision which Federal Reserve banks need how many of each denomination based upon a number of factors. There's the overall money supply that the Federal Reserve wants to maintain in circulation. That factors in along with demand and new notes are ordered when old notes become mutilated or just plain worn out. According to data published by the Federal Reserve, the estimated number of notes that reserve banks will destroy accounts for nearly 85% of the most recent print order. Although we can't tell how the number would be adjusted specifically for the two, the data does speak to the fact that not all $2 bills are being stashed away someplace. They're being circulated somewhere, and there certainly is a demand. But just who's requesting them? In addition to some of the individuals I was fortunate to meet, I learned that larger chunks of the nation's demand come from more than just individuals. There are a lot of groups and organizations that have used a $2 bill to highlight their specific agenda or cause. One such example is the Hornady Manufacturing Company in Grand Island, Nebraska, a manufacturer of small arms ammunition. It all started after city officials implied that the company wasn't contributing to the community. To be publicly chastised by some of them that somehow or other we aren't doing our part mm, was irritating. But then we started trying to come up with ways to show the city council our economic impact here and all of our employees, more importantly, their economic impact. My dad came up with the idea, let's give every employee $100 worth of $2 bills. So along with their annual bonus check, every Hornady employee was given a fresh stack of 50 $2 bills. This year, we handed out $61,000 worth of twos, and our instructions are, we want you to spend this around town. And when people look at you funny when they get a $2 bill, tell them where you work, because we want everybody to know what you as a Hornady employee do around town, what we all do as a team and a family together. 
This practice has been common since the two's reissue as a Federal Reserve note. In 1989, the Geneva Steel Plant in Provo, Utah used a similar tactic to highlight their importance to the local economy. A few years earlier, the NAACP designated a week in September as Black Dollar Days and asked black consumers to use $2 bills to demonstrate their purchasing power. And as recently as 2007, nudists in Pasco County, Florida, bared all of their twos to show their local economy how valuable they were. It's a proven method for making a statement, especially in larger quantities. When 30,000 $2 bills hit a community our size in just a few days, it's going to get noticed. From ammunition to guns themselves, the $2 bill is the perfect symbol for the Second Amendment. In the state of Virginia, where it's legal to open carry, Ed Levine uses twos as a way to create awareness about a citizen's rights to bear arms. I just kind of go through life in a normal fashion, and I don't circle around the $2 bill, but I certainly use it in my life to assist my movement. Sure, we go in there with our handguns on our side, but when we would hand someone a $2 bill and they'd say, oh, what's this about? It gives me opportunity to talk about my cause and my Second Amendment rights. Gun owners in other states have followed suit. Whether open or concealed carrying, the two is always an ideal tool to make a point. The $2 bill does act like a calling card for gun owners because what else do you leave behind with perfect strangers that they're willing to accept? A brochure, a business card, something else, but you give them cash money. I mean, I don't know anybody that won't accept a $2 bill and, and I get to decide what the meaning behind it is. It's all about the two's ability to start a conversation. In Michigan, advocates for the legalization of medical marijuana count on the two's unique ability to generate dialogue as a means of promoting their agenda. We've instituted what's called a $2 bill policy uh, starting July 10th through July 31st. We've asked people in the medical marijuana community to spend $2 bills at local retailers in everyday transactions. And then when the conversation gets sparked about the $2 bill, use that as a conduit for information transfer. You know, you hand them a two and they're like, okay, uh, this is the 10th two I got today as part of, what's up with the $2 bill? I give them the story. Oh, well, those are cannabis community guys. They're showing their presence by using the $2 bill. This came from somebody that was making some money with cannabis. With enough support, the hope is that the initiative lands on the ballot with the next presidential election. Until then, for at least the month of July, twos will continue to be in demand all over Michigan. Uh, so there's been a run of the banks uh, for twos. A lot of people are like, well, if you'd been here a couple hours ago, I'd have had some twos for you, but somebody just came and bought them. That, to me, tells us we're doing a good job. As if $2 bills weren't attention-grabbing enough, nightclub owner Johnny Diablo found another way to make his business stand out. I was uh, taking these $2 bills and I was putting this little magic red ring around it and made it look like vampire blood. The red ring was just to make the $2 bill a little bit more fun and basically signify that, hey, we just spent our night at Casa Diablo. About nine months later, here comes the Secret Service with a, a letter saying, we want you to stop putting red rings around these $2 bills. Why? The letter cited Diablo as having defaced U.S. currency, a crime punishable with imprisonment. But is what he did really illegal? After I came across a bill that had intentionally been marked, I went right to the source, Ben Cohen, the Ben in Ben & Jerry's ice cream. His stamp stampede is a movement aimed to eliminate money from politics by encouraging people to stamp his messages on paper currency, either manually or by inserting it into the Amendomatic stamp machine. This is the tower of corrupted power. That's Money Mouth. He's trying to talk with money. <laughs> No, it's not illegal. If you read the actual regulations, uh, they state that you can't cut the money, you can't punch holes in it, you can't make it so that it's no longer obviously money or change the denomination, and you can't advertise your business on it. But what we're putting on money is free speech. This is not defacing, this is decorating, this is adorning, this is beautifying, this is improving the quality of the money. Actually, the law says you can't deface currency with the intent to defraud. We're not defrauding anybody, we're just embellishing, making it more fun. Obviously, it's bias.
Not willing to endure the time and expense of a lengthy court battle, Diablo simply stopped marking his bills. But for the time his Red Ring 2s were in circulation, they proved something that Ben Cohen already knew. The people with $2 bills come up to me and they say, I'm stamping a $2 bill because people always look at $2 bills and it'll be more effective. This concept is actually nothing new. Go Tigers! Fans and alumni of Clemson University have been contributing to demand by stamping Tiger Paws on their $2 bills and spreading them all over the city hosting their college football bowl game. When Clemson was chosen to play in Miami's Orange Bowl in 2014, it meant that South Beach was about to be inundated with a unique brand of twos. I'll get a couple hundred. I ordered $400 worth. Sister's got $300, I got about $200. Right, close to $500. I've got only $200 worth. We, we hope to get some more and stamp some more. From taxi cabs to restaurant tabs, it was hard to go anywhere without seeing how the Tigers mark their territory. Well, the message is, is we support our team and we support whatever venue we're at, and we want to make, make sure they understand the economic impact of us coming. The $2 bill at Clemson University has become a very uh, cherished and much appreciated tradition. It's a calling card that Clemson people have come to use to signal their presence, to let folks understand and feel the impact of the Clemson spirit. The Tiger Paw makes it specifically unique and adds an extra layer of excitement, of energy. $2 bill says to one and all, Hey, Clemson folks have been here. George Bennett, Clemson class of 1955, is credited with starting the tradition back in 1977. Well, we had been playing Georgia Tech every year in Atlanta from as long as I can remember. This was our big game every year. So when it came time that they made the decision that they were not going to play us anymore, uh, it was kind of a slap in the face to us. And so I figured if we did something rare enough, it would get the attention of people in Atlanta. And the $2 bill was the, the thing to do. When we got down to Atlanta, people had pocketfuls of uh, $2 bills. That impact and impression was felt to the point was not lost and a tradition was born. Uh, when we went to the bowl game that year, we got the word out again, we're gonna take $2 bills, and this time we were gonna stamp them with tiger paws. And I guess at the time that we did it, I really and truly didn't have any idea that we would still be doing it 40-some years. The $2 bill has even evolved beyond the football field at Clemson. Fact is, a couple of years ago, they gave a $2 bill to every graduate. It's become intertwined with the fabric of Clemson University and the culture. It's this unique, relatively speaking, form of currency is the $2 bill that elevates it to this status of specialness in the, in the hearts and minds of Clemson people. My questions about demand had been satisfied. You have to believe that the people at the Treasury are pretty, pretty sharp. They know what they're doing. I think they're probably on to the fact that these things are much more popular than they really attribute it to. As I arrived at the last bill in my stack, I learned of a group who demonstrated just how popular the $2 bill really is. I'm Hank Eskin. I founded Where'sGeorge.com in 1998. It's a website that tracks dollar bills all over the country and the world. When you enter the serial number of a Where's George bill that you've come across, you can see where it originated and where else it's been. Although the $1 denomination is the focus of Where's George, its founder has been surprised at the number of $2 bill enthusiasts that the site attracts. I knew back then it was a valid piece of currency and it didn't circulate a lot. Um, but I didn't know that there was a whole subculture of people that really treasure the $2 bill. The users that Where's George attracts are people that are really into currency and they like the quirkiness of Where's George, which goes along hand in hand with the quirkiness of the $2 bill. My name is Fred Schechter and I've been circulating $2 bills for decades. I've had $2 bills that have taken years before someone gives you a hit on them on the computer. And so you get a message that it's traveled to Florida from California to Afghanistan with servicemen. Um, I've gotten hits in Korea, all over the place. Since I joined, I've entered 140,000 $2 bills. And I've gotten about 3,000 hits. I've got a normal Where's George stamp. And I'll usually do it near the edge of a table. 
real good, you can go crazy fast. The volume of bills that Fred has entered has made him somewhat of a legend in the Where's George community. He's a staple as one of the site's top toms. Way to get into that club was to enter 2,000 $2 bills on Where's George. And there's about 200 people on that list, and they have fun changing places in the uh, friendly competition of entering bills, tracking $2 bills. I joined Where's George in 1999, and eventually I had entered enough where I was number one for a short while. Um, now I'm number two, there's someone else who's entered far more than I have. My name is Ryan Sweeney, and I am the top Tom on Where's George? I've entered over 275,000. I would say it maybe fits under obsessive compulsive at this point. I mean, I just enjoy it, and I'd like to enter as many as I could, as long as I can. Ryan also maintains the top Tom list, a diverse group of spenders which demonstrates the wide range of the bill's appeal. They come from all walks of life. They're all different ages. There's people on there that are still in school. There's a lot of older people that are retired, and there's a lot of people that are very dedicated to using them, like, all the time. If you can't reach top Tom status, you can always share your passion for twos in the discussion forums, an area where $2 bill users had become so abundant that Hank had to set up a separate sub-forum just for them. This is where the community comes together to really talk about how they stamp the bills, how they spend the bills. It's like every other hobby, you know, you like to find people who you have this common interest and the forums really bring that together. Actually, a lot of users attend gatherings. They actually meet in person to trade bills, to swap stories. It's really quite a big network of like-minded people and they, they love um, everything about the two. As I decided on the bill that the Tooth Fairy was going to give my son, I still didn't have all the answers I'd been seeking about the two. But then again, neither did Eric Mintz. You know, I never definitively asked, said, you know, is there one unified reason, one kind of theory that sort of sums it all up? And that's when I started to investigate, you know, is, is there something around the number two? Is there some interesting mathematical properties? And, and there is. There's this an inherent duality in nature, you know, from our feet all the way up to our eyebrows. Everything kind of happens in pairs, right? And then there's this binary way in which we describe our physical world, you know, white and black, male and female, life and death. So everything is in twos. And there's some correlation there, even if it's metaphysical, but clearly the number two is a very unique number. You know, I, I asked myself if, if there was a $3 bill, would I be collecting a $3 bill? I, I don't think so. I don't think the $3 bill would, would really interest me. There's something about the two, for sure. A powerful symbol that represents pairs. Or in the case of Richard and Murta Gashar, two is a number that represented everything about their marriage and it's a bill that brought solace in a time of despair. We met in um, 1987. Uh, we were both in the insurance business, so we met through colleagues. We courted for maybe a year and a half, and during that year and a half, we got to know each other. There was a lot of shop talk about insurance, and then we started speaking more personally about our own lives, and what was meaningful in our, for our future. It was clear that their future would be together. One memorable evening, Robert made it official. We were in one of our favorite little hole-in-the-wall kind of restaurant in, in Manhattan, and we were sitting there, we were having dinner, and as usual, we were just um, having conversation, great conversation. Um, and uh, then he uh, pulled out two $2 bills. He asked me if I would uh, accept the $2 bill as a, an engagement proposal to marriage. And uh, I found that unusual. Instead of having an engagement ring, I had a $2 bill. So I told him yes, and he gave me a $2 bill. He kept his $2 bill, and he told me that this would be our second chance in life, a second chance in uh, marriage. Uh, he said, without each other, we won't be one. So we had to have a $2 bill to be one, to be united. And we were always to have the $2 bill on ourselves. Women have a little more gentle touch to uh, being romantic, you know, rom being romance and being very romantic. So I kept that $2 bill. 
I didn't think he did. I, I think he kept it, but not on, on himself. Um, but I was wrong. It was a beautiful Tuesday morning, and uh, he had left for work. And then I went into work around quarter to nine. I enter into the office, and one of the young ladies there told me that I had not known that there was a plane that hit the tower. Well, Robert Gashar worked for Aon Corporation in the South Tower, and he called his wife, Murda, um, to say that something had happened in the North Tower in the other building. Um, but that he was leaving and that he'd, he'd get back to her, he'd be fine, and he was not fine. I asked him, how bad is it? Is it really, really bad? And he um, didn't say, he didn't say anything for a moment. Then he sounded like he was uh, choking and he was starting to cry. And he said, I love you. And uh, we hung up. And at that point, I knew that this was really, bad. Tower 2 was hit, and when I looked, I saw Tower 2 crumble down, just go down. And I knew that I was never going to see Rob again. Several years after 9-11, the New York City Police Department contacted his widow to say that they had recovered some property. And what was found was Robert's wallet, his wedding ring, and um, inside the wallet was some currency. Well, I personally went to the uh, police uh, plaza in, in Manhattan, and uh, the officer went out, came back with the item. Everything is bagged up and everything is atomized. As they were opening up the contents, this is Rob's ID, his ID, WTC, the ID is there. This is his library card. This is one by one, one by one. And then in the currency, a $5 bill, a $1 bill, and a $2 bill. I, my heart just went boom. It was, I was with my friend and she had literally had to hold me because I was, I, I was, I knew right then and there that he was no longer a missing person. For a fact, he was there and he died that day. There was a lot of emotions, different types of emotion. It was the shock, the peace, and then I went into, uh, he had this $2 bill on him all these years, the, um, the shock of, Wow, he really, he kept his word. And I even had a conversation with the officers that were in the room. I said, wait a minute, I just gotta explain this to you. You don't understand how excited I am. I gotta show you something. So I went into my pocketbook and I pulled out my $2 bill and I held it up and I said, look, you see this? I found it. This is what this means to me. And they were all jumping for joy and happy and everybody was hugging each other. And I was hugging everybody that this was a closure of something out of this world. And it, it meant something to me. And I was able to share that with everybody that was in that room. Meanwhile, his ring is there, his wedding ring is there. I didn't even look twice at the ring. It was the $2 bill that gave me, the, my heart was pounding. Well, the, the $2 bill, it was her engagement gift from, from her future husband, so it was special for that reason. He said something to the effect of, this way we'll always be able to find each other, we'll always know. It was just something special. And um, when his wallet was found, she did know. Robert's $2 bill now resides at the 9-11 Museum at the site of the World Trade Center in New York City. Its presence there provides Murda with another sense of peace. I feel that I'm keeping his memory alive still by sharing the $2 bill, the love story with the museum and the world. They were a twosome, they were a pair. It's a two, there were $2 bills, there were two of them. Um, that, that's part of what makes it special too. Something else I've hoarded for many years is a collection of newspapers and magazines published in the weeks after 
I pull them out every once in a while as a reminder of what Americans went through that day. Now though, amidst all the tragedies, there would always be one story that I could remember fondly. Hey, Joey. Hey, Dad. Hey, buddy. Guess what? What? My tooth fell out. Wow. You know what that means, huh? Yeah. The tooth fairy is going to come. You excited? Uh-huh. That night, as I stood beside my son with cash in hand, I couldn't help but think about what I'd learned about the $2 bill. I came to understand that the Tooth Fairy was no longer the one who should be delivering this treasure. This is my other special $2 bill story. Uh, A little less than a year ago, my father passed away quite unexpectedly. And when my mom was cleaning out his nightstand, she came across an envelope, and on it, it there were just written two words, for Chris. And inside were six $2 bills. And I don't know how long they had been there. He had probably forgotten about them years ago. Um, But she gave them to me And the first thing I did when I opened that envelope was to give a $2 bill to each of my sons. And so that's just the the cycle of life. Life goes on. And that gift that my father had for me, now I had the ability to give to my sons. It's a connection that, you know, I hope to be as good of a father to them as my father was to me. And so one way, one little way that I can do that is is to to give them a gift that, that unfortunately my father didn't have a chance to give to me. Say go, slowly turn, and it disappears? Oh my goodness. Soon after my son's magic-themed birthday party came to an end, I set aside a special moment so I could pass down a little magic of my own. Oh, what is it? Two dollar man? That's one of daddy's special ones that I saved. Now you have one of Daddy's special $2 bills. Mm-hmm. Like that? Mm-hmm. That's now yours. It used to be mine, and it's now yours. It took a while for him to warm up to it, but once he did, he carried it around everywhere. I even caught him laying around with it, too. Most importantly, though, it afforded us the kind of quality time that you just can't put a dollar amount on. Well, everything is the same about that $2 bill as this one. Except for the guys on the side that got taken out. No, you have any room? No, no. Oh, yeah. I went from knowing very little about the $2 bill to having it become an important staple in the way I lived my life. Hey, Gloria. Yeah. Good, thanks. Here you go. Yeah, $100. Okay. See you again in a couple of weeks. Thanks. Thanks. I have every confidence that the $2 bill can have the same effect on everyone. Okay, Joey, put your stuff away. My name is Rick Dalby. I really started to make a connection with practicing compassion and goodwill towards people that needed the help. So I made eye contact, handed somebody a $2 bill, and usually just said, this is for you. And that's how it all started. Can I give you this? Oh, oh, that, oh yes. Oh, I'm that one. You know, you give them a dollar, it doesn't mean a heck of a lot. But if you hand somebody a $2 bill, They know it's intentional. They know that you thought of them. And you get a connection instantly. So it's an amazing tool. And that's what I really feel is special about the $2 bill, and that's that's why I use it.
Our business is to create products, and uh, one of our focuses is $2 bill merchandise. The first item, beach towel, we had a good time with that, and then we said, what, what else can we do with this? And we brought in some other things. What's the what, uh, best uh, best? We got the mugs, the mugs, the mugs, you know, shot glasses mugs. are great. Yeah. And the whole idea is really to just, you know, to create awareness. We're selling fun. People love the two, they think it's lucky, and, you know, it puts a smile on people's faces. I'm uh, Larry Belivis, and I come to the World Series of Poker pretty much for the last uh, five to seven years. What I use a $2 bill for is mostly for tipping. The dealers love getting $2 bills. They believe that it brings a sort of good luck to them. So they know that every time I win a pot, they get a $2 bill, and it's usually a very positive thing. So how'd you get your $2 bill? I got mine in the mail, I did this survey, sent me two bucks. My name is Evan, I go by Mr. E, and this is the art of money. Artists create money to begin with, and I feel like I'm sort of doing the sequel to the original creation. Everybody always thinks the $2 bill is the coolest bill because they're the least seen bill. So now you have a bill that's not usually seen, and it's not usually seen this size, so it's completely a, a wow factor. Sometimes people buy them, they, they own a restaurant, and instead of taping a dollar or two dollar bill on the wall, they'll put these up as good luck. I might use this screen, maybe. I think I'm gonna use this screen, if I can open it.